Chester's coat was elegant but cut was fine. The tasteful style was the ultimate in good design. This is why it caught the eye. A king would stop and stare. And when Joseph tried it on, he knew his sheepskin days were gone. Such a dazzling coat of many colors. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's scripture is from Genesis chapter 37, 1 through 4, and 12 through 36. That means we cut out the boring part. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. These are the descendants of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him an ornamented robe. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your, fathers, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornamented robe that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the ornamented robe taken to their father, and they said, this, is, this we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. I was wrong. There were some um, big, bigger, harder words in there. Um, I heard y'all laughing like, what is she talking about? Uh, so uh, we, um, I, I, did you know that story? Y'all have heard that story before? Um, I heard a part of that story before. Knew, maybe it reminded you um, that you did know it after you actually heard it read or you've heard it before. Maybe you've never heard it actually read, but you have heard of the story. Um, so if it sounds vaguely familiar, that's good. Uh, this is just one chapter in about 15 chapters of this story. This is just the start of it. This is not a short story, the story of Joseph. Um, it is one of the core stories taking up more space in the book of Genesis than Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, all of those combined. Like it is a core story. Joseph comes at normally the very end of our line of names that we might quote, though, about um, if you ask who's in the Old Testament. Um, most people don't know of Joseph as well. Most people who maybe did not, um, I don't know, grow up in a Baptist church in Joanna, don't know of Joseph like they did, like they do all the rest. Um, and I would say it's, for me, though, it, it's the story to know. Like, it is the story of the Old Testament to know because it is the most satisfying story, I think, in all the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures. 
And though we normally think that Joseph is only Jesus' father, um, and Joseph, this Joseph, might, this story might be one of the greatest glimpses, pre-glimpses, um, nods to, not intentionally, but um, something very similar to what we see lived out in Jesus. So it's the story to know. Um, and it's got the plot of, of something Shakespearean. It has everything in it. Passion, intrigue, reversal, and revenge, and, and um, betrayal. And, and, and this is just the first chapter that we read today. But as the story progresses, throughout it all, Joseph blossoms like some kind of ancient Cinderella. Sold into slavery by his jealous half-brothers, he winds up ruler of Egypt, which so changes who he is that they do not even recognize him when they finally see him again. When they show up to him and they're begging for food in the midst of their own famine. And he could have gotten even with them, but he didn't. Well, he did a little bit. Um, he tortured them a little and t taking one of the brothers hostage and, and framing another as, as a thief. But in the end, he reveals himself to them and takes them into his household where he cares for these brothers that sold him into slavery until he dies. And doing so, he brings this book of Genesis that we know for so many other things to this beautiful happy end the saga that began with the banishment from the garden in Eden and the violence of the first two brothers, remember, Cain and Abel, it then finally ends with this like family reunion in the land of plenty. But throughout all of this, there is one character that is missing throughout this entire 15 chapter saga. And that, chap that, that character is God. Did you know that about the story of Joseph? Earlier in the book of Genesis, God was never hard to find. In the beginning, the creator was there every day, tending to the garden, garden and, and, and talking with the two who lived there, talking constantly. And then God speaks to Abraham, and God speaks to Noah, and God gives some very, um, sometimes very long-winded um, very intentional instructions over and over again to those who are following God. But all of this changes with Joseph. By the time Joseph arrives on the scene, God has become mysteriously quiet. Not absent, but quiet. There, there, is, there are no more divine speeches. There are no more long lists, whole chapters worth of instructions for God's people. For Joseph, there is no audible proof of God's presence in his life. And so when Joseph wanted to hear the voice of God, he had to listen differently. He had to listen to his life, to his dreams, to the people he met along the way to the things that happened to him each day. These were how God were speak, was speaking to, to, to Joseph, and he learned to be a pretty good interpreter of these things, paying close attention to all the events of his life, even the ones that like hurt him to the core, that frightened him to the core, even the ones that seemed to go against the will of God altogether. And they may not have have made sense to him, one by one, each of those events. But by the time his brothers show up, he could see this pattern emerging among them. No one had explained it to him. God was known for explaining everything to many before. No one had explained to him this pattern. Nobody, no one explained to him how God had shown up, but he could see God's fingerprints all over his life. The brothers themselves were no help at all. So, um, although Joseph had already forgiven them for what they had done to him, 
they still were so afraid of Joseph. Maybe it was his strange new Egyptian haircut or um, this accent he had developed over time living you know, in the South. Um, but I think it's that, um, that thing that always makes us afraid. It's their, their own guilt. The way that, that, that guilt eats away at you, you know that? I think it was, it was their guilt that kept them continuously afraid of Joseph. They, they knew that they, that they had wished him dead. They had thrown him into a pit to die. And then they changed their minds. And you think maybe that was, that was better than killing him. No, they decided to sell him instead for a profit rather than killing him for free. They had dipped his robe into the, the blood of, of, a, of a goat and, and taken the gruesome thing back to their father. All of that. And now, now he's saving their lives. It would have been easier for them if he had beaten them first or it made them slaves like he was for the rest of their lives to him now. They would have understood better because that's how the world works. That, that's, that's how the world works, crime. That's how our world works, crime and punishment, retaliation and revenge. But Joseph didn't see it that way. He was nobody's victim. When he, when he looked at his life, he didn't see a, a series of senseless tragedies. He saw this, this, this lighted path. A, a part of it led to a pit in the ground. Another part of it down to Egypt with his hands tied behind his back. Another part of it to, to Pharaoh's prison. But when Joseph looked down at his feet, all those, all those various individual events seemed tragic, but when he looked down at his feet, he could see it. He could see there it was, the road that had led him straight to where he stood now. It was not you who sent me here. But God, Joseph assures his brothers when he tells them who he is. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, because God sent me before you to preserve life. And then he told them to go fetch their father, Jacob, and to come live with him because that was the only way this spell of guilt could ever be broken, not by the ones who had done the wrong, but by the one who had suffered it. Joseph sounds a lot like Jesus, the Son of God who had the power to set things right. And he did by reinterpreting completely what had happened between them and removing the blame. And just as with Jesus, Joseph's brothers just did not get it. They didn't get it then, and they never did throughout his entire life. They just did not get it. The brothers operated under a completely different understanding of cause and effect in life, right? But Joseph's offer was the difference between life and death to them, and so they went back, and they brought Jacob back with them to Egypt. But Joseph still remained this complete mystery to them. They never really trusted him, the one who, who got that robe. The robe they always wanted, thought they deserved. And so when their father died, they were just back at it again, right? Scheming to save their own lives, which were actually not ever in danger. Their lives were never in danger, but they keep trying. Try telling that to guilty people. Try telling people who, are, who feel this, this weight of guilt to not be afraid. 
They're so stuck in their own wrongdoing that they, that they think everyone else is up to the same thing around them. And so they go to their brother, Joseph, mentioning a little something that he might have missed if he had been at the vigil for their father. Your father, Joseph, he gave his instruction before he died. He said, say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime your brothers have done, the harm that they did to you, the wrongdoing they did to you. It may or may not be true that, that his father said that, but that's besides the point. For Joseph, nothing was beyond the creative power of God. Not lies, whether or not this was another one, not treachery, not years in prison, not even death. The things that happened to Joseph, they weren't, they weren't trivial. In fact, multiple chapters in Genesis, he weeps over these things. They weren't they were tragic. They weren't trivial, but Joseph, all of those things for Joseph were redeemable, depending on how they were used. Their meaning was, was what, whatever God and, and Joseph could make of them. You meant evil against me, Joseph said to his brothers, but God meant it for good. He's not blaming them. He was, he was just explaining reality to them, which, which they misunderstood up until that point. They had thought they were in charge of the meaning of things, that the goodness or the badness of an event or goodness or badness of an event in life, a moment in life, was dependent on human intent. That is why they felt so guilty all the time. If they had meant evil when they sold their brother into slavery, then evil it was for them. Even if they were sorry afterwards, or so sorry that they couldn't even stand their own company anymore, there, were, there was no going back for them. But what they had not reckoned, what they had not reckoned on was the intent of God which is far more inventive than the, the intent of us humans, right? Like, God just seems to make art out of everything. Give God, like, a, a tire rim and a, and a wrecked bicycle and a brass bedpost and some duct tape. Watch God make, like, some gorgeous art display eagle out of it. Nothing is too bent up to be used by God. Not even tragedies. Not even bad decisions. Not even plain human meanness. It meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. It not only sums up Joseph's story, it sums up the entire point of the whole story up until this point, the snake, the forbidden fruit, the murdered brother, and all the rest that follows, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's this statement about divine providence, but it's been, you know, it's been tainted over time, and, and through religion, it mean, to mean all kinds of things that it does not mean by people with big, you know, crying eyes who smile at our tragedy and pat us on an arm and give us assurances that don't actually mean anything and don't, don't hold their weight and make us feel dismissed in our pain. They're there, I know you're hurting, but I don't really want to hear about it right now because I've got so many things on my calendar. The Lord will make good of it though. The Lord will provide, run along, and say your prayers, right? In his book on Genesis, um, one of my favorite writers talks about, his name is um, Walter Brueggemann, um, he talks about the tension built into the story of Joseph. It's like the whole purpose of this story. That there are really two dimensions to it and two dimensions to life. First, there is real human shepherding. 
There is real betrayal in this life. There is real grief. There is real famine. There is real weeping. And the second, that there is real divine faithfulness. There's real rescue. There is real blessing. There's real healing. There's real food. And each reality depends on, on the other. He says, elevate one at the expense of the other and you blow the entire equation. Because neither one is the truth all in itself. The reality is that all by itself, the human situation looks like pretty darn bleak, <laughs> right? We do terrible things to each other. Our fear and our greed make monsters out of us and nations that are not at war with other nations are at war with themselves usually. And we, we all know that a battle goes on in each one of us. Maybe that's the battle of guilt for you. We really are in great jeopardy. And if that is all we know, then we are surely doomed to despair, right? But jumping from that to absolute certainty about God's plan isn't the answer either. Not all by itself. Because all by itself, that conviction ignores human suffering. And it turns this into some kind of religious romanticism that you might have experienced before that sees only what it wants to see and discounts the rest of human experience. That kind of certainty where mortal pain and, and, and doubt have no place at all except as failures of faith. And all that counts is victory. And everything else must just be illusion, then. Can you, can you imagine someone leaning, leaning down over the edge of the pit that Joseph was in? While Joseph's brothers are busy bargaining with the slave traders and yelling, Don't worry, Joseph! Everything's going to turn out just fine in the end. You just keep praying down there. What a miserable denial of God that would be. The God who, who does not live way up here, pulling some strings, calling the shots, but the God who lives so very near to us, in the midst of us, giving, giving us our freedom and holding the divine breath while we make our choices, right? That's, that's the providence that we should, we should know and proclaim. God is committed to us, to working through us, which is what the divine providence is all about. And in this dance between the very real pain and the very real faithfulness, it's not God's job to keep the bad things from happening. That's what Joseph's story teaches us. Bad things are going to happen. They do. Brothers are going to turn against brothers. People are going to be bought and sold. Famine devastates the land. Terrorist plot, nations, a war. And God's job is, is not to prevent these things from happening. God's job is to, to stay present in them and to keep on being God. Creating whole worlds out of total chaos. Breathing life into piles of dust taking the unfathomable wreckage of our lives and making something beautiful out of them in spite of what we do. Because that is who God is. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the work of God's hand is so evident that you, like, you can see it a mile away, and sometimes it's like you have to dust for God's fingerprints in your life. Sometimes the voice of God seems to come straight from heaven. Sometimes it comes through the voices of strangers and friends. Like, sometimes it just comes through this multi-textured patchwork coat that God seems to be laying over your life and your shoulders just when you need it. And that's why when Joseph wanted to hear God, he listened to his wife. 
It's all the patchwork of it. And what he learned, he told his brothers when he died. He said, God will, God will surely visit you. This I know. And he was right. I think he also right for us. Let's pray. So we hang God this morning between um, the tragedy and the joy, the pain and the, and the faithfulness, knowing that they are this complete package. Without them, we cannot possibly know the goodness of God. The God who is not all bad, <laughs> making things happen in our life, causing the pain, but also the God who doesn't just say, pray away the hurt, but gets down in the pit with us. It feels so real to me, God. It's almost like I can't not believe it. Because that feels like life. But maybe that's why, God, you took on human existence, took on flesh. Because even though that's who you've been all along, we had to see it walking and breathing among us. That kind of middle ground between tragedy and joy. The ugliness of this world and the beauty, God, you make out of everything. Thank you, God, for that gift of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.